I don't normally work in, uh, on the Earth. I'm normally looking at other stars, but I've always tried to place all of my work in the context of the Earth because the Earth tells us what we, uh, gives us some ground truth when we look at uh, extrasolar planetary systems. Um, and I, I, what I'm going to be, what Ollie asked me to talk about is the assembly and delivery of material to planets. And this acknowledges that, that the Earth didn't magically appear fully formed as it is, uh, as we see it today, with, with life on it. But it had to form somehow. There were processes that formed it. And those processes, if you think about that as the delivery of material to the Earth, are, are ongoing even to this, to this day. And luckily, we know quite a lot about the processes of planet formation nowadays through a, a number of observations that we've made of, uh, of stars and how they form. From, from that, we, we know that as a star forms out of the collapse of a cloud of gas uh, and dust under its own gravity, as part of that process, the, uh, the star forms with a disk, or a massive disk of gas and dust around it. And if you look on this plot that shows the amount of mass that you have in dust around a star, this is in millimeter and centimeter sized pebbles, as a function of the age of the star, if the star is born around, around here. And we see for the first 10 million years or, or so of a star's life, it has enough mass in dust in this disk that's, that's orbiting it to be around 100 Earth mass. So it's got enough mass in the disk to, to, form, to, to form planets. And that's why these disks are known as protoplanetary disks. So this disk lasts for, for about 10 million years. Uh, up to around 10 million years. And we now know a lot about these disks because our telescopes can resolve their, their structures. So this is uh, an image of the, uh, of the protoplanetary disk around the star HL Tau taken with the ALMA observatory. And what we're seeing here is the millimeter and centimeter sized pebbles that are orbiting the star. This is quite a large scale of, uh, of, of around 100 AU. The, the, the Earth would be all, all within this, this central region. We haven't quite managed to resolve the uh, the, the region where the Earth, on size scales of the Earth, but we can see this is a very structured disk and we're getting a lot of detailed information about the processes that are ongoing. And we know not just from these observations, but also from laboratory experiments of how dust would, it would interact within these disks and numerical experiments, that we know more about the processes that are going on. And we know that the dust will settle down to the mid-plane in the disk where it could be dense enough, uh, have dense enough regions where the dust will collide with other dust grains and it'll stick together and grow up into centimeter sized pebbles. And then those, those pebbles can also move around uh, within, within the disk. And, and if they get into dense enough regions, then they can collapse under their own gravity to form planetesimals. And those planetesimals can then go on and collide and and grow into even bigger things that can become planets that can eventually, uh, if they get big enough, start accreting uh, gas from the surrounding disk and to grow an atmosphere. And broadly speaking, we understand the, the, that's, that's our broad picture of, uh, of planet formation. There's also an, other things that are going on, such as the, as you go further out in the disk, the disk becomes colder. And as you go further out, this means that uh, some of the vol volatiles that were in the ga gaseous form, if you go far enough from the star, they can condense into, into solids. So, where a planet might form in this disk will determine its, uh, its composition. So broadly speaking, we think we understand planet formation, but then there are still quite a lot of unknowns. For example, I, I, I can't, I'm not going to have time to go into, into all of them, but this is an example of a paper for, from last year, highlighting the, uh, uh, illustrating the uncertainty that, that there are between different competing models. So in this paper, they were asking the question of whether the Earth formed from uh, the agglomeration of multiple planetary embryos, all very similar to the Earth. Multiple of these were, were formed all at the same location, and then they slowly collided with, the, each, uh, with each other and eventually ended up with the four planets that we know today. Or if instead they formed by pebble accretion, where you form a few planets and then the pebbles from the outer part of the disk then migrate inwards and then get accreted onto the, onto the Earth. And this illustrates that there's still uncertainty at the level of, uh, of this kind of uh, this is still being discussed even, uh, even today. Um, and of course, this has implications for the composition of, of the planets, because if the Earth formed from material that, that all grew at the same location as the Earth, then it would be relatively dry compared to if it formed from the accretion of pebbles that originated in the outer disk where they could have been, could have been icy. Another thing that's illustrated here is, that, is the importance of, of Jupiter, because Jupiter acts as a barrier that can prevent 
the pebbles passing, passing inwards, but it can also help by scattering some uh, planet, uh, planetesimals and embryos from further out. So it's, it's also important to understand not just how the Earth formed, but how the whole planetary system formed. And there's still uncertainty in uh, the exact timing and location of uh, where Jupiter formed. But one thing we do think we know about the, uh, the final assembly of the Earth is that this picture of multiple planets, may maybe more than the four planets that we have today, having formed in the inner solar system, it, it is the case because we think that the, Earth, that the Earth's moon formed in, the, in a collision with another planetary embryo. In the canonical picture, this, this collider has the name of Thea, has been given the name of Thea and, and is about the mass of, of Mars. And it, you have this collision that then throws off part of the, uh, part of the mantle that forms a, a disk around the Earth that eventually accretes into the, into the moon. And there's lots of uh, evidence pointing, uh, pointing towards that. But actually, even, even now, we're, there's a lot of discussion about whether it really was something that's the size of Mars that collided with the Earth or something that actually could be quite, the parameters of that collision could be quite different. But we think this happened and it happens after the protoplanetary disk dispersed. So remember the protoplanetary disk lasts up to 10 million years and from the ages of, uh, of the rocks on, on the moon, for example, we know that the, this impact occurred uh, more like 50 million years or so after the solar system formed. And these processes we think also occur around other stars, and we think we've, uh, we've seen them. For, so for example, these are two observations of the star called HD 172555. And here we see from the mid-infrared spectrum, we see a characteristic signature of copious quantities of silica dust. And this is silica dust that you would expect to form in a hypervelocity impact like this, the, the, the moon forming collision. And in this observation, we, we've detected carbon monoxide emission carbon monoxide that should be very, very short-lived. And so the fact that we see it means it must have been produced recently. And we think what we're seeing is the atmosphere of the, the planet that was collided with in this, in this collision, that is, some of that atmosphere has been stripped off. And that uh, moon-forming impact wasn't the last uh, impact which occurred on, onto the Earth. We know these, the Earth continues to acc accrete material. If you have patience and go to a dark sky, you will be able to see See meteors, and this is the rain of uh, small dust and, and pebbles onto the Earth. The Earth also uh, accretes larger planetesimals, uh, asteroids, uh, and comets relatively infrequently, but these are obviously can be important if uh, the dinosaurs could tell us, although they, they couldn't because, because, because of this. But <laughs> these, these are important for, for, for processes relevant to, to, uh, to life. Um, and this, these are obviously things that are uh, are catastrophic, those that occur on, on tens or hundreds of millions of year timescales at the moment. But back in the past, this bombardment was much more, more frequent, and you can tell this by looking at, at craters on the planets and, and moons uh, in, in the solar system that don't have tectonic activity that, that erase that, that history. But we can tell that the, the bombardment must have been more intense in the past. So where do these impactors come from? Well, they come from, there's three main sources. You've got all of the, the planetesimals that were left over after the Earth was forming. Not all of them ended up on the Earth. So there, was, there was a large uh, quantity uh, left over. In fact, that's the dominant part that forms the, the, the late veneer on the Earth uh, and, on, and on the Moon. Then there's also asteroids in the asteroid belt orbiting between Mars and Jupiter. And we've got the comets that orbit out uh, beyond Neptune in, in the Kuiper Belt. These three different reservoirs all contribute to delivery of material to the Earth, and they, have, they contribute different things. They made, have different compositions. We've got more ice coming from the comets, um, and then from the leftover planetesimals, they'll be relatively dry. So you have a, a different, different composition being delivered to the, to the planet, and they also have different sizes, different uh, velocities of which the impact which affects you know, the implications for the, uh, for the Earth. So one of the things that these, these impactors do, they, they obviously they deliver material to the, to the Earth. They also uh, affect the atmosphere. So we've already seen from the example of HD 17255 that you can, th the impact might uh, strip off some atmosphere. So if you have a, a very big impactor, you know, 1,000 kilometers or so in size, then that can send a shock front going through the planet that can then blast off some, some of the atmosphere and lead to large-scale melting. 
If you have a kilometer size impactor, it could come down, land on the surface, cause an explosion, and result in a crater. And if you have smaller impactors, they, 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 they can be uh, disintegrated within the atmosphere. And this can affect what happens to the atmosphere, and it also affects the delivery of, uh, of material. It can deliver water that can, be, can end up in, in the oceans. It can deliver complex organic molecules, and it can even uh, lead to the, be a driver of prebiotic chemistry in, uh, in ways which uh, people in the audience are probably more, uh, more familiar with than my, myself. And so I can't tell you about, uh, about life at the moment, because that's not uh, about, about how that leads to the, to the development of life, but, I'd, uh, but I'm interested in contributing to, to my, what, what I know. For what I, for what I know at the moment, I can tell you about what happens to the atmosphere. For example, I had a, a, a PhD student who finished last, last year, Kat Sinclair, and this is a plot from her, her thesis that shows this is what would happen to the, what we know about the bombardment history of the Earth, what would happen to the Earth's atmosphere as a result of that, that bombardment. The thing is, we don't know how it started. She started with different, different uh, mean molecular weights, different compositions of the atmosphere and additional different starting masses. All of these circles are where the atmosphere started. And then the crosses are where, are where they ended up. So you can see they all converge down to about the same location, which is very similar to the Earth's atmosphere that we see today. And I don't want to take, you to take away from this as being, this is, this is what happened to the Earth's atmosphere, but this, this is what would happen due to the bombardment, that the atmosphere would have been changed by these, uh, by these processes. And obviously, there's a lot of other geological processes that, that others can talk to that are going on at the same time. And finally, I just want to, to point out my extraterrestrial uh, perspective, or exoplanet perspective, which is that this bombardment is also going on on, on on other stars. This is just an example of star Eta Corvi that's got a Kuiper belt out here. If we look close in to the star, we can also see lots of hot dust that's, that's in, its, in its habitable zone. And we can also see that we think that comets are being scattered inwards, and as they come inwards and they cross past around 20 AU, where the ice line is where they'll start being heated up by the star and releasing some of their volatiles, we can see carbon monoxide at that point. So if there are any terrestrial planets within this system, then they are, they are probably going, undergoing a very intense bombardment at, at the moment. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it. Leave it there for you, Ollie. The, the quick summary is planets form in protoplanetary disks, but they can continue to be, to be bombarded throughout their history. And we, still, and we see some of these processes that are going on in other systems as well. I wondered about stochasticity in bombardment. So if we're looking at an exoplanetary system, maybe a mature one without lots of gas and dust around, how deterministic can we be in saying something about the bombardment history, any given planet in that system? Maybe a, a sort of juicy looking habitable zone planet will have experienced. Well, the, the, the answer is that, well, to, to know what the bombardment history is, then we're going to have to know something about the, the planetesimal distribution around, uh, around the star. And for some stars, we do know this, so we can look and about one in five stars you look at, you can tell that they've got a Kuiper belt, and so you know how much material there is there. And about similar one in five stars also, you know how much dust it's got in the habitable zone. But you're right, in terms of stochasticity, that's, that doesn't tell you everything. It just tells you there's a fairly constant level of, uh, of dust at, uh, at some level. But then for, for the bombardment, that is stochastic. There's going to be some level at which there's always going to be a rain of, uh, of um, in a hundred meter kilometer sized objects raining down on the planet relatively continuously. But when you think about the very large impactors, the thousand kilometer sized impactors or larger, they, that will be a stochastic process inevitably in, in every single system. So you, you won't be able to be completely deterministic. We would imagine that very large impactors might be removing more material, you know, as well as adding stuff. But for smaller um, impactors, maybe lower collisional velocities, might more efficiently deliver their volatiles. So is there like a golden window of material that efficiently delivers a larger mass um, of volatiles efficiently or not in the simulations? It, it, yes, it, it does depend on the, uh, there's the, the, the golden point. Well, it's, it's actually for, for removing material is per the amount of mass coming in, the amount of mass loss per mass coming in 
is maximized actually for kilometer sized impactors. So there's more mass coming in in, in bigger impactors, but, but less material is, is lost. And yeah, they, they will deliver more, more uh, volatiles to, to replenish an atmosphere as well. Yeah, so when you said that one in five systems that we have observed have a Kuiper belt, does that take into account the observation bias? Or like, are we actually able to constrain that uh, frequency now? Yeah, it's, it's an observational frequency. So that's the amount, the fraction that are observed to have, um, to, to have Kuiper belts. And these are Kuiper belts that are much more massive than our own. My inference would be that, that maybe 100% of stars have a Kuiper belt, but the question is how much mass is in it. And the top 20% that we can detect that have maybe 10 times more mass than our own Kuiper belt, we can detect those. We can't detect our own Kuiper belt at the moment, so, but presumably that sits within the distribution, but we don't know whether it's around the middle or whether it's an outlier of being relatively low mass because we just haven't seen the intermediate ones. I was just wondering your thoughts on possible systematic differences in impacts in uh, G versus M dwarf systems, given the importance of M dwarfs for atmospheric characterization in the near future. Okay, so, so uh, the problem with M stars is we don't know very much about them. They're so low luminosity that we don't know very much about their debris disks. So, so I can't say very much um, statistically about whether they have the same levels of Kuiper belts, for example. But they do, some of them do. So, uh, and I think my best estimate would be they'd have the same level of Im impactors as, as a G star. So, so the two so sunlight stars and, and lower mass stars should have the same kind of impact. Of course, the terrestrial planets, the habitable planets, would be that much closer in. And how much material reaches them is going to depend on all the planets that are further out that are trying to scatter material inwards. And, uh, and yeah, we, we don't know that for, for sunlight stars or for, um, for, for A stars, to be honest, at, at the moment, because we don't know the Neptune-like planets and, and Jupiter-like planets. But if the planetary systems are similar, there should be the similar level of, of impactors. So, Mark, I thought um, your point about late accretion delivering volatiles and complex organics is really exciting. And we know that that doesn't just happen on Earth. There's evidence for it on Mars, on the Moon, on Four Vesta. But on Earth, the geologic record of that's obviously been erased. Can we get any clues into the volatile delivery or organic molecule delivery from looking at meteorites, the sample, the surfaces of these other, other parent bodies? Yes, well, those, those other bodies are, are, get, uh, are doing, I said, we've got a, this, this bombardment history um, that, that we've got for the solar system, for the different components, the leftover planetesimals and the comets and the asteroids. And they're, they're constrained by, in exactly that way by looking at the bombardment rates on the outer moons in the solar, in the solar system, for example. And so there's a whole bunch of constraints that have gone into that. Uh, and I'd, lo I'd love to know if there are more constraints that we can use because it really is just trying to piece everything together into, into a history that I'm sure will be changing in, <laughs> in the next few years as we learn more.